Steven Spielberg, I, I came to Lincoln, I must confess, through Doris Cairns Goodwin's book. I knew little more than the fact that he'd been shot in, uh, in the theatre and that he'd ended slavery, but not much more than that. But you came, you lucky man, through childhood. I did. I, I, well, I, ca I came through childhood with an interest based on trauma or the trauma of, as a little kid, being forced up the steps of the Lincoln Memorial to stand at the feet of this gigantic statue. And, you know, as a kid, you're told stories of Jack and the Beanstalk, and that was as close as I came to, the, to Jack's giant, as you could, you, could, you could imagine. And I was utterly terrified. I don't remember everything, because I was six years old, but I remember the size of this monstrosity and being afraid to look at the face of the statue and only looking at the hands. And, uh, and, and, and as I was being led out of the memorial, I remember looking, daring myself, and then just taking a quick peek at the face and instantly feeling a kind of warmth all over that, uh, that I, I guess only a kid can feel, a kind of, oh, that's not so scary after all. And, and that, inf that sort of informed my interest in Lincoln which I was able to independently take up, even though school was only, you know, superficially glossing over the dates, places, and names of the people uh, uh, causal in ending the Civil War and abolishing slavery. I did extracurricular reading about that period of history, which became my favorite period of history, that in World War II, uh, until Doris wrote her book, and that was my way into, that was my way of accessing the president in a very personal way for the first time. And yet, even when you read the book, deciding what on earth you are going to make a two-hour film uh, about in this vast life, it's not easy. And you, you, you have distilled a particular and, of course, absolutely pivotal quadrant of his life. It was, well, it was, it was the final quadrant of his life. Uh, before his life ended so so abruptly, and uh, but it was the most lasting achievement of his political career and his career as a compassionate, deeply thoughtful and mindful human being, in that he did abolish slavery and then ended the war, and was the only one that thought that that must be the order, otherwise uh, this war would have simply been. There would have been just a hiatus between this war and the next war over slavery, the issue that began the Civil War in the first place. And, and even though a lot of people feel that Lincoln has blood on his hands when he could have ended the war early by abandoning any hope of a 13th Amendment to abolish slavery, what he did is absolutely causal in like, the next 100 years or more. There was one great African-American man in Lincoln's presidential life, Frederick Douglass. And I'm wondering whether you were frustrated yes. not to be able to deploy him, because actually, despite the liberation of the black man in America, uh, there are no really formidable black figures in your film. Well, there, there, there are black figures in our film, and, and, and in terms of formidable, I think one of the greatest statements in the, of, of the picture comes from Elizabeth Keckley, uh, Mary Seamstress, and constant companion. But, but, but we feel that the issue of slavery, and we also feel that every black voice in our film is a significant one. Um, but of course, because the film only took place in the last four months of his life, we were not able to show the three times that Frederick Douglass encountered Abraham Lincoln in person, the first of which several years before. Uh, and after the first meeting, Frederick Douglass came out and reported to everyone that Abraham Lincoln was the first white man who did not notice the color of his skin. <laughs> and um, Lincoln read all of Douglass's publications in his abolitionist newspaper and really felt the watchful eyes of Douglas, but he also had the watchful eyes of his own moral strength, Abraham Lincoln did. Uh, so he had, you know, Team Arrivals is about surrounding himself with supporters and opponents of all of his positions and taking the best wisdom that everyone had to offer in opposition or support and coming to the right conclusion. A lesson which... He was, he was one of the most mindful 
listening leaders ever. Well, a lesson which um, President Obama possibly still is needing to learn because he, he loves Lincoln. I mean, he took Doris's book into the White House with him with the Bible. I think those were the only two books he said he took in the initial moment. And she goes in to brief him about the presidency from time to time. Uh, you know, do you see him yes. ever managing to, to reach Lincoln? Well, I think President o Obama, who has referenced Link Lincoln and even has acted in a sense Lincolnian in the same way that Lincoln appointed his chief rival for the nomination, William Seward, to Secretary of State, and then Obama appointed or invited Hillary Clinton, his chief rival for the nomination, uh, to become his Secretary of State. There's, 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 there's beautiful parallels already based on not just what he says about Lincoln, but, but, but what he's actually done. But then if you think about... About what, bipartisanship, about bringing... Go ahead. But then if you yeah. think about one of the great issues Please. of his time, uh, gun control, you know, I, I, you do find yourself wondering how Lincoln would have tackled that. Uh, well, you know, you know, Lincoln, you know, you have to remember that Lincoln allowed all the uh, soldiers of the South to keep their guns and their horses and their farms, what was left of their farms, because so many of them had been decimated with Sherman's march, after Sherman's march. Um, but Lincoln allowed everyone to keep their firearms after the war. In a sense, I suppose I was, I was looking, you know, the, the fascinating thing is that he, he clinched this slavery issue in that dead part of Congress's time in office between the election and the inauguration. And suddenly gun control became an issue in exactly the same period for Obama. And I just wondered whether there was a dash for the gates the president could have made uh, using the wonderful tactics of bribery, which you bring out so clearly in the film. I don't know if you can do that now. Well, I, I don't advocate that. Uh, you know, we have something called the media and a camera in all the rooms, it seems. I, I think the shady, murky work of uh, pa trading votes for patronage jobs, which was not illegal, but, you know, uh, on the cloudy side, is a little harder to do today with so many cameras snooping around. Well, of course, that brings us to the whole point about the presence of cameras. I mean, if cameras had been about in a big way in Lincoln's time, do you think he could ever have been elected? He would have been the ugliest president there's ever been, wouldn't he? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, well, you know, I, I don't know if Lincoln would have, I guess, what you call the TVQ of the people that, who do run for president in this day and age. Um, uh, but Lincoln had his, had his shot at history. He had his time. He was, he was, he was a great man, but... He, but that greatness never would have come to the surface without the greatest crisis that ever faced America landing squarely in Lincoln's lap. Um, uh, you never know until a president is tested what they're capable of. You, John F. Kennedy averted a nuclear holocaust during the Cuban Missile Crisis. In Roosevelt, on his watch, we had the Great Depression and the Second World War. The greatness of people come out usually when there is something to test them with. Um, but I don't know how Lincoln would have done. I don't know if Lincoln could have gotten um, elected governor in this day and age, only because he doesn't look like the kind of person that we seem to elect. But then you had to find somebody who could Today. play this man. And uh, that would really be the director's greatest challenge once he decided what he wanted to do with the film. And I'm, I'm wondering, did you immediately say there's only one man who can play this part? and that's Daniel Day-Lewis, or was it chance, or what happened? Well, there was no one else I could imagine who could make the transformation from, from human being to this particular human president than Daniel Day-Lewis. He was the first thought I had when Doris told me she was writing a book in 1999 about the, pre, the, the Lincoln presidency, the Lincoln White House years, and the Civil War. And, and, and Daniel, not because he so much looks like Lincoln, but because he is arguably the greatest actor in the world and was even then, to me, for <laughs> me. 
he was my first and last choice. And I wouldn't have made the film had Daniel, when I offered him the film for the third time, had he said no three times, I, I wouldn't have uh, pursued any of this any further. How did you clinch it the third time? Well, it was clinched by two people. Tony Kushner's brilliant screenplay, which Daniel had never read. He had turned down another script I had developed on Lincoln, which was more about the Civil War than about the presidency. But it was Tony's screenplay and Doris's book that I think clinched it. And I think I had a little bit to do with it, too, at that point. I think uh, 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 we had both grown up, made a, 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 a number of different kinds of movies that proved a lot of things to each other, mainly proved a little more to Daniel. He didn't have to prove anything to me at that point. I tell you, in watching it, you, you, you are never aware that an actor is playing Lincoln. It is Lincoln. You never think of Daniel Day-Lewis, you never see him, you see Lincoln. And I know from reading about it that Daniel Day-Lewis totally immersed himself in the character very, very intensively. Um, I, I've also read that, that you were affected by the presence of this man on the set, of, 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 of Lincoln on the set, uh, and that you even thought about what you should wear. Well, uh, Daniel as Lincoln changed my approach to directing the film from the, from the outset. Um, you know, I really felt that I had spent four months with the 16th president of the United States, <laughs> and I'm not talking in any kind of a supernatural, paranormal way. I'm just saying that even behind the scenes, sitting in a room waiting for me to call him to the set to start work with this little, little plate of a few nuts and raisins, and grapes, which is what Lincoln often ate, uh, reading, reading Euclid or reading, um, I mean, it was kind of amazing to be able to walk into a room without Tony Kushner's text and talk to Abraham Lincoln. So for me, it changed everything. I, I suddenly stopped wearing dungarees and hoodies and pullovers and looking schleppy. Um, I started to, first time ever I wore a tie to, to, as a director <laughs> on, onto a set. And I kind of ba banned the use of cell phones. Nobody was allowed to bring their cell phones onto the set. Nobody could do crossword puzzles or read the New York Times, unless it was an 1865 antique edition. Hmm. I, I, I kind of was uh, uh, the, the, the 19th century period police. And, and, and to the credit of all this company of great actors I was so blessed to serve with on this project, all of them didn't do any small talk, they didn't talk about the kids, didn't talk about sports, didn't talk about the television show they watched last night. Everybody was devoted to the text and to the time period that we were working in, and we kind of helped each other exist in another time, another era. It was a wonderful experience. I'll, I may never in my entire life have, have that experience to talk about again. Daniel Day-Lewis already won the Golden Globe for Best Actor. You are both nominated for Oscars, you as director, he as actor. Does it still matter to Steven Spielberg to win a director's Oscar? Well, it, it, it matters so much when people like your movie. You know, starting with the journalists and critics and then the audience that has come out in droves to see us in our American debut and, and, and then the film critics organizations and the Golden Globes and the nominations for the Oscars. It's, it's, it's a tremendous uh, a, a bit of, um, uh, it's a confidence builder and it's, it's so supportive of, of, of the film and all of our work on the film. So absolutely, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful time of, of year for all of us right now. Okay, you have realized a tremendous ambition in making Lincoln. Uh, you say you have seen the greatest acting performance, in a sense, that you ever expect to see in some ways. What's your ambition? Well, I never know my ambition until I become ambitious. <laughs> and uh, so right now I'm on a little bit of a hiatus from ambition. And, uh, and I, I'm, I'm, like always, waiting for something to seize me. And when it does, I'll do something about it. I don't know when that's going to happen. I had a science fiction movie I was very keen to make, uh, but I, I had a kind of a epiphany about it and um, reworking it from scratch, and that may take some time. So right now, I'm, as they say, gainfully unemployed. 
Uh, one final question. I mean, um, Jaws, E.T., Jurassic Park, Schindler's List, Lincoln, I mean, one could go on and on, but the diversity of what you've made, where, where do you get the diversity from? How can you be so lateral an operator? Well, I, I never felt that I had a, a, I never thought I had a kind of uh, consistent style. I never saw myself as like a, a Capra or a Hitchcock or a Kurosawa or a Truffaut or even a David Lean, who, who, all of whose films were like epic books, epic novels. Um, I, I don't think of myself as a, style, a stylistic director the way Scorsese is very stylistic. I, I've always thought of myself more like Michael Curtiz or Victor Fleming, those kind of workhorse, eclectic directors of the 1930s and 40s that were just interested in everything equally. And I've always felt that way about myself. I, I have so many crazy dissimilar interests and I think that's why my films aren't kind of from the same mold every time. Steven Spielberg, thank you very, very much for talking to us. Thank Lovely. you. I really enjoyed this. Thank